Warning, this video may contain content that may not be suitable for children or anyone else that is easily offended. Strong language, graphic content, nudity, bad jokes, and a possible idiot, aka myself, may be featured in the following clip. Viewer discretion is advised. You're not responsible for any damage that you receive watching this video. <laughs> What's up, y'all? It's Zims. Today, we're going to be reacting to top three crazy ways people escape death. This video is by Mr. Ballin, so if you haven't already, be sure you swoop down to that description box, claw on that like button, head over to Mr. Ballin's channel, subscribe, and make sure you watch the video in its entirety. We might be pausing and stopping through the whole thing. It's about time we get some kind of relief, man. I'm tired of seeing people die, but we're about to see how people cheated death. I've seen many stories about it before. It's crazy. Boy, man, we're right around the corner from 1,100. Thank you guys so much for participating in that giveaway. If you haven't already, the giveaway is down below. Four more days or five more days left, I believe. So if you want to win make sure you uh sign up for it it's not too late to win actually you can sign up day two and you can still win this, this i'm telling you bro you can still win this video was requested by sherelle thornton so thank you so much for requesting this video incredible survival story let's get it but before we get into today's i couldn't stories, survive a fan of the strange dark, dark and mysterious delivered in story format then you come to my channel because that's all we do we upload every four and five times every week so if that's of interest to you please invite the like button over to let's go for oreos and milk but replace all of their oreos cream filling with play-doh also, Ooh. please subscribe to our channel i'll be mad notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. yo all right, get ready for that Mr. Baller reaction dance. Bats. I hope it wait. Bat bats or bats. In 1994, 39-year-old well, Barry year. Barry took part in the brutal Marathon des Sables, which is a six-day endurance race covering 155 miles through nah, the desert. That's too the much. The competition was known as one of the toughest in the world. But Prosperi was a former Olympic athlete, and he kept himself in unbelievable physical shape. He I was wish. also a police officer back in Italy, which kept him even more active, so he felt ready. The competition. Believe it or not, I used to want to be a police officer. Um, I don't know if I still want to or not. I mean, I'm still thinking about it. You know, that was always something I really wanted to be when I was a kid. But I don't know. I'm still thinking about it. But damn, man, I wish I was in that good of a shape, bro. I wish, but I don't have that mental fortitude to like, you know, convince myself to get up and run every day and work out and eat healthy. Like eating is one of the things I enjoy most like there's no like I don't like putting boundaries on what I like to eat especially if I want to eat it I don't want to hold myself back from eating it so that's why it's really hard for me to like get in shape and get strong and do all that stuff because I can't I don't want to weigh food I don't want to eat the same thing every week I don't want to have a light like you know what I'm saying like I just want to enjoy my life desert terrain was so dangerous <laughs> that participants had to indicate where they wanted their bodies sent if they did not survive the race in preparation for the race Prosperi would run 25 miles a day for weeks leading up to it and he would give himself less and less water as he was running to get a if you ever sign up for something and they ask you where your body wants to be placed don't sign up custom to dehydration but despite how much he was training and his incredible athletic resume that showed he's someone that can probably do this his wife was very concerned but he would tell her you know the worst thing that's going to happen to me is i'll get a little sunburned the race kicked off at its starting point in morocco on april 10th and initially it was going very smoothly prosperi was always at the front of the pack and he was always the first italian to finish that day's stage and so when he would finish he would go to his tent and he'd put an italian flag on the outside to show the other italians doing the race where they could find him to come inside and chat and he would say that part of the race was really fun then things went wrong on the fourth day during uh -oh. the longest and most difficult phase he got lost he took a wrong turn that morning it was already very windy and he found himself in this section between these two big sand dunes and the pace setters had already gone way ahead so he's totally alone and then out of nowhere this massive sandstorm kicks up and completely blinds him he can't go anywhere because he can't see where he's going and so he manages to kind of feel his way to this rock where he gets down behind this rock and he thinks to himself i'll just wait it out and then continue on but the sandstorm raged for eight hours he should have stopped finally done it was totally dark outside so prosperi couldn't see anything so he decides, you know what, I'm gonna have to sleep on the dunes and tomorrow morning I'll have to get up and keep going. And his biggest concern at this point was not that he was in a survival situation. Is he still winning? It was, man, I was in fourth place in this race. And now with this huge setback, I'm probably gonna finish last. And so when he- My man's a champion. He's not worried about, hey, I could potentially die out here. He's worried about, am I still gonna win this race? But props to him, cause I would have been boo-booing on myself, bro. I would have laid a couple of bricks out there between them dunes. Man, that's some kind of determination right there. I wish I had that much determination. 
went to sleep that night, all he was thinking about is, man, I got to get up and go as fast as I can so I don't finish last tomorrow. But when the sun came up the next morning, Champ. Prosperi looked around and he realized he had a much bigger problem. The sandstorm had been so strong, it had completely altered the landscape. The dunes had all moved around. He had no points of reference. And so even though he had a map and he had a compass, he had no way to orient himself. So he had no idea what direction to go. Anybody that competed in this race really needed to be self-sufficient. And so Prosperi had a knife, he had plenty of dehydrated food, he had a sleeping bag but he had oh, very good. little water. He had about a half mm. bottle of water because at each of the checkpoints during the day, the race officials would give you all of this water. And the idea was you would drink it all by the time you got to your next checkpoint and mm. he had not made it to the next checkpoint. And so, so he didn't get no water. As yep. he's looking around, realizing this is a really bad situation, he thinks to himself, you know, other runners must have had this same thing happen to them. They probably had to hunker down yesterday during the sandstorm and they're they're just waking up now, they're looking around, I'm bound to find someone, we'll link up and we will get to the end of this race and we'll be just fine. And so he runs to the top of a sand dune and looks around expecting to see someone and he doesn't. There's no one in all directions. It's just completely barren. Desert. That's crazy, so he bro. Leaves that sand dune goes up another one and does the same thing. He's looking. So my thing is, if it's nothing out there, how do like rattlesnakes and other things find food? Like, don't they? Like, that's weird. I know. I'm to watch some more Discovery Channel because I don't see how they where are they getting water and stuff from. Like, where are the animals getting all this stuff? Maybe they're animals, so maybe they could find like some, like a little water spot or something. But I don't understand how they would survive out here in this, this desert. Like, that's wild, man. Around and there's nobody there. And over the course of several hours, he was just running to the peaks of these different sand dunes, expecting to see someone, not seeing anyone, becoming more panicked and expending more energy. And finally, by the late afternoon, when he's sweating profusely and the sun is bearing down on him and he still hasn't seen anyone, he realizes he's going to die if he keeps doing this. And he needs to be smart about this. And so at this point, he went into survival mode. And he decided that the only times he's going to move are going to be at Dude, night and in the early morning hours. Smart. Because those are the times when the sun is not up and it's still pretty cool and he can conserve energy that way. He also began peeing into bottles and began conserving his urine to drink later when he did run out of water. And so over the next two days, he conserved his energy, but he was just kind of drifting through the desert and he wasn't really getting anywhere. He didn't know if he was making progress because he had nothing to go to. He wasn't seeing anyone and... He was starting to realize the situation is getting worse and worse by the minute. And then, in an incredible stroke of luck, he comes across this Muslim shrine in the middle of nowhere that what veterans the? would use as they traveled across the desert. And he ran inside hoping that there'd be a person in there. Nobody. And there was a person in there, oh. but they were dead inside of a coffin. But he was happy that he now had shelter over his head, and this felt like progress. He began... So... they just left that person in there or was a funeral ceremony recent or if i walk in and see a coffin with nobody there no but like no pamphlets or obituaries or anything like that bro like that's a red flag in my head maybe in the middle of nowhere too cold maybe this is what he's seeing right here does that even look like something that should be in the dead that don't even look like it should be still standing or something. i'll just look like something from the hill the hills have eyes or something and taking stock of his new surroundings and when he was inside the shrine looking up into the ceiling he saw it was lined with hundreds of bats. And at this point, he's really hungry, he's really thirsty, and so he climbed up into the rafters no. and began grabbing handfuls of bats and drinking their blood. After drinking the blood of 20 bats, he used some of the wood that was inside of the shrine and he built a fire outside. And that would be his way to signal planes and helicopters going over. Bro, this man is built different. Drinking bat blood? Do they carry they carry diseases, don't they? <laughs> he gonna be like one bat, uh, uh, uh. two bat, uh, uh, uh. And he comes back inside, expecting you know over the next couple of days someone's bound to find him, but nobody does. And four days go by, and three separate times a plane or a helicopter flew directly over him. He's got his fire going. He's out there flagging him down, but nobody saw him. And so at the end of those four days, he's now been out in the desert roaming around for nearly a week. And he's starting to realize that this is the end. He's not going to survive this. No one knows where he is. Just no take some bats and go. He's running out of supplies. This is it. And so knowing he was staring down a long, painful death, either by dehydration or starvation, he decided he was going to expedite it. And Man. he later that he did not feel sad about this. It just was a logical choice he was making. He figured this way, if he died inside of the shrine, 
the shrine was more likely to be found than if he had died somewhere out in the desert where sand would cover him up. And that so makes he sense. Said it was more likely people would find the shrine and therefore find him, and so there'd be closure for his family. And so Prosperi took a piece of charcoal from the fire, wrote a message to his wife, and then cut his wrists and laid down, expecting never to wake up again. But the next morning, no. he woke up and he had Why would he do that? You fight to the end. You don't use fight to the end. You don't do that. He was strong from the very beginning. Don't do that. He had barely bled because his blood was too thick. He literally could not bleed to death. He took this as a sign that he was supposed to live. And there you go. He felt motivated to survive. He decided to leave the shrine and follow the advice that one of the race organizers had given all of them at the start, which was if you get lost, follow the clouds you can see just beyond the horizon at dawn, there you will find civilization. Follow so the Prosperi clouds. Hopped up Dang. And heading towards what he believed were those clouds. This dude he saved his life. For days in the desert, grabbing snakes and lizards off the ground and eating them raw. He said his inner caveman came out like his primal desire to live and he had no problems eating the things he was eating. Prosperi it it had to be rattlesnakes. He couldn't even urinate anymore. So he began drinking the liquid inside of succulents that grew inside of dried up riverbeds. And he also began sucking out the moisture in his wet wipes that were in his backpack. On the ninth day, Prosperi saw a little shepherd girl off in the distance and she saw him and she was scared of him and she turned and ran away. And at first Prosperi is devastated because he has no strength to chase after her, but she had actually gone down to her tribe and told them about this strange man wandering the desert and they came running up over the dunes and they brought him in and they gave him food and drink and they sent someone to get police. After police picked him up and brought Bro, let's just pray. I mean, thank God for that. My man is built different. You sucking water out of baby wipes? Bruh, this dude is Bear Grylls, Steve Irwin, bruh. All them people mixed together, bruh. This dude is out of control. I would have never thought of sucking water out of wet wipes. Man, he was sucking water out of dry ri riverbeds. Let's just be happy it wasn't no green infernal type situation where the tribe was like animals and stuff but they helped him out brad brought him back to their headquarters he discovered he had walked over 181 miles from where he had gotten lost on the course all the way to algeria his family and race organizers had gone out looking for him after he went missing but all they ever found was his shoelace and so they assumed he was dead it would take him two years to fully recover from this ordeal I but bet. after he did he went on to run eight more desert races Bruh, he's a beast. Number two, turtles. In 2012, 35-year-old Jose Alvarenga was an extremely experienced fisherman, having spent years and years commercially fishing. In November of that year, Jose volunteered to do a 30-hour deep-sea fishing shift for his company off the coast of his hometown in Mexico. He hoped he'd be able to catch some sharks, marlins, and sailfish, three of the more lucrative sharks? fish you can catch. What did he say? the guy Jose usually went deep-sea fishing with was not able to go at the last minute, but Jose still really wanted to go out and do the shift, and so he took the only other fisherman in their company that was willing to go or that could go, and it was a 23-year-old, extremely inexperienced, brand new fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. And while Jose knew he was not he going to be a huge asset out on the seas, he figured, you know, it's a short trip and we're not that far off from shore, so you know what, he's fine, I'll take him. On November 17th, the pair set out on their 24-foot fiberglass skiff with a small motor. On board yeah, were nah. fishing tools, a radio, and a large ice box. We need a bigger the boat. Fish they were going to catch. Once they reached the area they were going to be fishing, their trip immediately started paying off. And within just a couple of hours, they had already almost completely overloaded the ice box. Their luck was so good that when they saw a storm coming in, they decided to wait and continue to catch as many fish as they possibly could before heading in at the very last minute. Um, nah, bruh. You gotta cut those winnings short. Especially for storms coming in that little bitty boat that they had, bruh, and them waves. If there's anything like the waves that Mr. Ballin got in the background, bruh, you can count me out. I was with you when y'all started catching fish and filling up the coolers and stuff, but once a storm coming and wait until the last minute, Nah, bro, you never want to wait to the last minute. You always want to get a head start. The storms maybe look like it's moving slow, but they be moving pretty quick. But the storm that was rolling in was like the storm of the century. And by the time they did turn around to head into shore, it was too late. They got caught up in this wicked storm. For I am a survivor expert bruh on the outside not not being actually in the survival because i can give you tips on how to survive i told you you never want to wait to the last minute because storms move faster it's kind of like when you look at the car so objects are closer than they appear bruh that's what this is nature is closer than what it appears it might not look like it's close but it's close bruh I'm telling you, you guys need advice come to me you'll be alive i'm adding five extra years to your lifetime 
as of right now. The rain was so intense, they literally could not see to shore. They tried to use their compass and other instruments to navigate to shore, but between the winds and the waves and the fact that their boat was so heavy from the nearly thousand pounds of fish they had caught, they were just really unable to get anywhere near shore. When the storm just continued to rage and they were just kind of floundering in the water, they decided they needed to dump their catch. So they dumped all 1,000 plus pounds of fish back into the water. But even then, with a more agile boat, the storm was so severe, they just could not navigate effectively. And so Jose turned off the engine and told Ezekiel that their best chance here was to just wait it out. And once it was done, they would head back into shore. But that storm continued yep. to rage for five days. The torrential rain never stopped. That's a long the storm. Were huge. The winds were awful. And before long, they were getting pulled out to sea and had no idea where they were. Now, they had only planned to be out for 30 hours, so they did not have much in the way of supplies. And so after a few days, they had run out of food and they had run out of water. Eat those fish. Probably because it was raining so much, they were able to drink the rainwater. But the real immediate problem they were facing is over the course of those five days, the storm was just battering their boat. And by the time the storm cleared, their boat was ruined. Their motor had been torn off. And I caught it. Gone. Their electronics were busted and all of their fishing gear was either damaged or gone. Yeah, there bigger was boat. a charge in the radio for Jose to call back to his boss on the mainland and send a mayday message. But the radio died before they got a return message. So they weren't able to confirm if anybody on land was going to come looking for them. Left with minimal supplies, no radio, no motor, Jose and Ezekiel just had to hope somebody on the mainland heard their message and they slowly began to adjust to life at sea. Jose was able to leap into the water. I don't know if it makes a difference, but if I ever go to sea, bro, I'm bringing me like three or four floaties because your boy can't swim. Like I'm bringing me some kind of raft or something. I'm bringing two rafts just in case one has a hole in it. Bringing a pump in case I have to blow that sucker up. Or maybe they got the little pull thing where you can pull in them bloats up. At least two flare guns, bro. Beef jerky. I'm bringing a whole lot of stuff, bro. And you, you ain't about to get me. I've seen too many movies. And catch turtles, fish, seabirds, and jellyfish with his bare hands. And so that's what they ate. And then the jellyfish? two of them would try to catch rainwater whenever they could. But the majority of the time, they had to drink their own urine and turtle blood. Despite their initial what optimism the that their boss had probably heard their Mayday message and would be sending people out to get them, as days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, they realized that probably no one was coming to find them. Now their only hope was a plane spotted them flying overhead or perhaps they could drift into a shipping lane and a boat could spot them. But without any way of navigating their boat, they really were just leaving it up to luck. Despite their dire situation, Jose stayed really positive and he focused on catching food and catching water and he tracked the time really diligently by tracking the phases of the moon. Ezekiel, however, just did not have a significant role on the boat because he just wasn't skilled enough. Oh yeah, he was an amateur. Himself sitting in the boat most of the time doing a whole lot of nothing. That sucks. He fell into a deep depression. He was not accustomed to being out on the water the way Jose was. Jose had been raised on the water. He practically only ate seafood and a lot of it he ate raw. So in a way, Jose was kind of at home. Ezekiel was not. And then by the fourth month, Ezekiel just could no longer stomach the food they were eating. The fourth month? It's only so much turtle blood and jellyfish that you can eat, bro. Like, can you imagine doing something for the first time and this happens? I'm pretty sure Ezekiel probably would never do this again. He's probably never touching water again. He's probably never going on a boat again. He probably wouldn't even drink the Sani or Aquafina or any of the other water that you may drink smart water. He's not touching any kind of water after this, bro. I think he's done. Just gets sick every single time. And so he just kind of gave up and he stopped eating. And even though Jose urged him to eat and would get him food, he yep, didn't eat it. He and shut down. He starved to death. Even though Ezekiel was not a huge asset in terms of helping them survive, he did provide Jose an enormous amount of comfort. It was like... Well, I did say in the beginning that we were taking a relief from death, but obviously I was wrong. It was another death, so uh, yeah. Partner in crime here. And then once he died, Jose was alone for the first time in nearly half a year, and he fell into a very dark depression. And for six days, he did not touch Ezekiel's body. He just sat there and stared at him and even contemplated taking his own life. But on the seventh day, he doesn't know what it was, but he had this sudden urge to want to survive. And so he gave Ezekiel a kind of makeshift funeral. He said a few words and then disposed of his body in the ocean. And then after that, Jose became laser focused on just surviving. And survive he would for another nine months, all by himself, out in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, drinking this dude's a blood, beast. drinking his own pee. But after those nine months, he would finally see the thing he had been dreaming about, land. 
he had managed to drift all the way to the Marshall Islands. So he leapt out of his boat, he swam to shore, and there was a hut right on the beach. He knocked on the hut and a couple came to the door and they were totally shocked to see this guy. He, he didn't look too good. And they couldn't even believe his story. They, they couldn't believe that he had survived for so long in the water. But they quickly brought him inside. They gave him some food and drink. Oh, man. I know. He destroyed it. He was saved. His parents and young daughter, when they found out he was alive, they were overjoyed. They, along with everybody else, believed he had perished. They had sent out a search party for them. And they'd found pieces of their boat that had broken off in the storm. And so they assumed, you know, they must have sank. Then, in a strange turn of events, shortly after he got home, oh, people itch. began accusing him of lying about what happened. People said he looked too good to have been out on the open ocean for 14 months. What you mean too good? Do you see this dude, bruh? He hasn't been home in a minute. What you mean he's lying about what happened? Where is he gonna be, bruh? Bruh, look at my man. He look like he's been homeless for about two years, bruh. I bet a can of soda, bruh, probably knocked his socks off. Dang, I forgot how good this tastes. I just wish Ezekiel didn't stop fighting, man. I know he got tired of it, but some people just have that urge to live. He fought as long as he could, but I get what he's saying. You get tired after seafood, because I eat seafood like a lot in one day, and I won't have it for like a minute. So I get where he's coming from, but you have to understand the kind of situation, man. You don't have much of a selection so you gotta do what you gotta do but i bet if beyonce said something people are like oh yeah she did that yeah she sure did surviving uh, mount everest all by herself oh yep she did it like when someone else do it they're like oh no i don't believe you video or didn't happen he should have been emaciated and at the very least he should have had scurvy but doctors scurvy. would say he ate so many turtles and seabirds that he was pretty well fed and turtles and seabirds contain a high level of vitamin c that would have protected him from scurvy. Other what? skeptics said it would have been impossible for his skiff to float the 6,000 miles to the Marshall Islands where he ultimately found land. But then a study done at the University of Hawaii confirmed there was a current that would have pulled him from the coast of Mexico straight into the Marshall Islands. And then lastly, Ezekiel Cordoba's family accused Jose of killing Ezekiel and eating his body for sustenance. That's the only way he was able to survive. But Ezekiel roundly rejected that and took multiple lie detector tests that proved he did not do that. Today, yeah. Jose lives in a Why would he eat this dude? He's a he, he lives in the ocean. He was catching fish and seabirds, bruh. Ezekiel's body lasted for a year and some change. Like, come on, bruh. Ain't nobody about to eat no human body over a year and some change. People need to stop hating, bruh. No, I couldn't do it, so it didn't happen. It's just unheard of, I guess you could say that. Like, it's impossible. People would think it's impossible, but anything's possible, bro. I believe that. It just takes a certain kind of person to do it. ...town in El Salvador, completely surrounded by land, and he says he doesn't go anywhere near the water. But yeah, him and the Italian guy need to link up, bro, because that was ridiculous. They need to be make a survival class or something. In 1971, Julian Kepka was a bright-eyed German teenager who had just graduated high school. On Christmas Eve of 1971, she and her mother were at the airport in Lima, Peru, Peru, waiting for a flight to Pacolpa to visit her father, who was a zoologist working in the Amazon. She and her mother and everybody else waiting for this flight were really annoyed because the flight was seven hours late due to bad weather. Finally, she arrived and Julianne, her mother, and everybody else who had been waiting boarded Lanza Flight 508. And immediately after takeoff, they started hitting some pretty bad turbulence because of the bad weather. But Julianne really liked flying, so she didn't mind. Her mother on I would. was white knuckling the armrest. Me too. And after 10 minutes or so, as they were getting nearer to cruising altitude, the turbulence was not getting any better. In fact, it was getting much worse. And Julianne was starting to get worried herself. And then when the- I feel whoever, bad for whoever's next to me hitting turbulence, because all you go feel is this on your thigh. Yeah, bruh. Boy, constrictor. The plane started shaking so violently that all of the overhead bins opened up and luggage and wrapped presents and Christmas cake started pouring out. Christmas Julianne cake. Julianne now began white knuckling the armrest. As she's sitting there, she looks out the window and she sees all this lightning right outside their window. And it was clear they were literally flying through a lightning storm. And so Julianne and her mother are just looking at each other, unable to speak because they're so scared. And they're listening to the other passengers screaming and yelling and everyone's starting to panic. And then the plane starts really shaking nope. up and down, like it's being lifted 50 feet and Jesus. dropping 50 feet over and over. And then all of a sudden, there's this bright flash inside of the cabin, and then the lights go out. And then they look out the left side, and they see smoke and flames coming out of the engine that sits on the wings. That's and my the breath. It felt like it was just falling from the sky before it dipped into an aggressive nosedive and just started bombing straight down. I would have booboed on myself. It turned out that big flash in the cabin was lightning striking the engine. Julianne would say, despite this unbelievable chaos, the worst moment imaginable, her mother grabbed her by the hand and said, this is it. It's all over. Aww. That was the last thing her mother ever said to her. 
After that, all Julianne can remember is the sound of other passengers screaming and crying and the awful grinding sounds that the engines were making. Yeah. And as she's listening to these horrible sounds getting ready to die, all of a sudden the noise just stops and she's outside of the plane. She's still strapped into her seat, but now she's in free fall away from the plane. And she remembers thinking how unbelievably lonely she was. And then she looked down and she saw the canopy of the jungle fast approaching. And oh my goodness. Can you imagine holding on to your mom's hand and the next thing you know you're outside the plane watching the plane go by and you look down and you see this? Bruh, like what are you... Oh my gosh. Man, that's some scary stuff, man. It makes you like... This video right here just makes you not want to do anything, bruh. It just makes you want to stay at home. It makes you not want to travel. It makes you not want to go swim. It makes you not want to go snorkeling. It just makes you appreciate life a lot more. It makes you realize the amount of chances you are given each day you decide to step on a train. Each day you decide to go on an airplane. Each day you decide to go on a cruise ship. Or you have the possibility of dying. I mean, you can die walking across the street. So, I mean, you might as well live your best life. You can die sitting in your bed. Something could fall out the sky and land on you. You know what I'm saying? You never know. She probably can never recover from this. She was about to die, and then she passed out. She remembers nothing of the actual impact, but she would later find out the plane broke up two miles up. So she was in free fall for two miles in that seat before hitting the ground. She woke up the next day looking upwards towards the jungle canopy, and the first thing she said out loud was, I survived. And she's looking around and she yells for her mother, but there's no one around her, no one yells back. And that's when she realizes I'm all alone and probably everybody, including my mother, is dead. She had somehow managed to not only survive, no broken but bones. only have a broken collarbone and some deep cuts in her leg. She could hear planes overhead that were most likely looking for the crash that's site, it? potentially survivors but she couldn't see them because the canopy was so thick, so they couldn't see her. She was wearing a very short sleeveless mini dress and flip-flops, but in fact, she had lost one of her flip-flops, but elected to keep the other one on because she had lost her glasses in the crash and she was incredibly nearsighted. Jesus. So she would use this one flip-flop to test the ground ahead of her. That's smart. Committing with her bare foot. Before the crash, she had spent a year and a half at her parents' research station out in the Amazon. Ooh. In that time, she'd picked up very valuable survival skills for being in the rainforest oh shit the first thing she did was stand up and go looking for a stream because her father had told her wherever there's a stream that stream will oftentimes lead to civilization and so she began walking and sure enough she found a stream and instead of just walking next to the stream she got in it and began walking directly in the middle of the stream Why? because her parents had told her that you're less likely to get attacked by a predator if you're standing in the water versus standing on land she only walked a little way. I wonder why that is. Are animals scared of water? Because if they are, I've seen a couple of animals just beast right through water. Like, it, it's not even there. So I'll, I'll kind of want to do some research on that and find out why animals are less likely to attack you on water. Unless there's some biology people down in the comment section that may be able to clarify this for me. The crash site. There was no bodies. It was just debris. And all she could find that was useful was a small bag of candy. So she took the bag of candy and continued walking down the stream. And for several days, she trudged along. And she would say during the day it was incredibly hot and miserable and at night it was very cold and since she only had this small dress on it was particularly miserable but she said the scariest part of the whole ordeal was at night when you're trying to sleep it's totally pitch black animals. in the middle of the amazon and there's predators all around you she said it was horrifying on the fourth day of being in the jungle as she walked down the stream she heard the sound of a landing king vulture a sound that she recognized from her time spent at her Ooh, parents' Amazon. They're waiting for her to die. I know and she's the injured. The sound of this vulture was just around the corner, so she couldn't see it. But she knew these huge vultures only showed up Wait. because there's a ton of dead meat. And so she knew as soon as she rounded that corner, she was going to come face to face with the bodies from the crash. Please don't see her mom. even her mother. But she kept moving forward. She turned the corner, and sure enough, there were bodies. The vulture took off, and what she was left looking at was a bench with three passengers on it still buckled in and all three of their heads had been rammed underneath the earth. They had clearly landed head first. Immediately, she had an intent. Do you guys understand how fast you have to be going for your whole head to go underneath the earth's surface, bruh? But they're, all three of their heads were buried underneath the ground, bruh. And I'm pretty sure if you were to move that seat, their heads would have came off. This doesn't sound like this is real life. It sounds like an animation or some like simulation or something like that. This is unreal. I like I, I don't know what's going through her head right now. Like just imagine you fall two miles from the sky, man. Land and you only have missing flip flop and a couple of scratches and your glasses are missing. And you look over and you see these people buried 
in the ground. I would just be asking myself, like, why me? Why did I survive out of everybody? You know what I'm saying? Like, why? I would never take a plane again, but at the same time, I would just be thankful, man. That's, man, I wish I could talk to this person. Be like, yo, what was going through your head when you seen this? Tense sense of panic because she had never seen a dead body before, and she thought one of them was her mother. But when she went over to examine this particular corpse, she saw her toenails were painted pink, and her mother never painted her toenails. And so she had this intense sense of relief that it wasn't her mother, but at the same time felt very ashamed of that thought. There was nothing on the three bodies or near them that could help her. I mean, she shouldn't feel ashamed only because the first thing too, if something crashes, the first thing you're going to go look for is your family, you know what I'm saying? Because that's all you know. Afterwards, you might go back and help some other people, but my main focus would be finding my mom too, because that's the person that's been there for me since I was a baby, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to look for my family first. It's only natural instinct. Survive. And so she said her goodbyes and she continued walking down the stream. By the 10th day of this ordeal, she could barely stand straight because of a broken collarbone and the pain in her leg. Oh yeah, the and broken so collarbone. Drifting down the river in one of the deeper sections. And then she thought she was hallucinating when she saw this big boat docked up against the side of the river. But when she went up to it and touched it, it was real. She went up on shore, she looked inside, there was no one in the boat, but it looked like a boat that was used and there was a path that led back into the jungle. And so she followed the path and it led to this hut and no one was in there, but outside was a jug of gasoline. And she had this wound in her arm that was full of maggots. And she remembered her father using gasoline oh, yeah. to get maggots out of a wound in their dog. And so she but I know maggots help clean the wounds, right? That's what a lot of people, I know some, uh, I know some medical personnel around the world use maggots to clean out wounds. I don't know if these are the same maggots or if she just don't want the maggots on there, but I thought maggots clean up the bad stuff. Gasoline and dumped it in her arm and she said it was excruciatingly painful but she was able to pull out 30 maggots and felt very proud of that accomplishment. After that, she fell asleep inside of the hut and just hoped that whoever lived here eventually showed up. And sure enough, the next day she woke up and she heard two men talking outside that were walking towards her. And she said the sound of their voice was like the sound of an angel. And when the two men came up the path and saw her, they were obviously very shocked. And they initially thought she was like this water goddess from a local legend that involved a half mermaid, half woman that was light skinned. And she would tell them in Spanish that she's not a water goddess, that in fact she's a girl and she had just survived a plane crash and she really needed their help. It was getting probably not the time for it, but I probably would have milked that situation. Like, yeah, it is me, the water god. Uh, take me to the hospital so I shall recover and prosper and rule over the Amazon. They'd have like, oh yes. <laughs> Getting late that day, so they couldn't bring her out of the jungle right away. So they helped treat her wounds, they gave her some food and water, and the next day they brought her back to civilization. The day after her rescue, she was reunited with her father, and apparently he was so overcome with emotion because he believed she was dead that for several hours he just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lanza Flight 508. Hold on, wait, how many? Survived. He just couldn't speak. Julianne was the sole survivor of the 91 people who boarded Lanza Flight 508. Oh, she her was mother actually survived the crash, but then died several days later because she couldn't move. Oh. This is something that haunts Julianne and her family because they think about how horrible those last few moments for her mother must have been. Julianne ultimately recovered from all of her physical injuries, but to this day deals with significant emotional trauma. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found these... I told you. It was like, I knew she wasn't going to be the same after that, bro. But can you imagine that you could have potentially saved your mom, but you didn't know where she landed, so your mom was stranded out there for nights on end, holding on to dear life, and then eventually died? In today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it, so give us the timestamp, and if you're the first to do that, We'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button over to your house for Oreos and milk, but replace all of their Oreos cream filling with Play-Doh. Play -Doh. Also, please subscribe to our channel. Yeah, and our channel. Notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three, four, even five, five videos uploads. every week. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the it's same. It's John, John Ballin 416. I also have a ton of Facts. content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. Big shout out to Sherelle Thornton for recommending me this video, man. It was a great video, man. Thank you so much for that. Man, that's crazy, bro. Survival. One survived off candy, one survived off fishes, and then the other survived off bats. Yeah, I hope I never have to find myself in that situation, but if I do happen to do that, then may God be with me and I can tell the story as well. But what story did you guys think was the worst? I mean, they all got it like pretty bad, you know? It's not really about 
who had it worse, but which situation would you would not want to find yourself in? You get what I'm saying? I think the airplane one. The airplane one was kind of like you was minding your own business and something unfortunate happened, like a lightning strike in the uh, the engine and whatnot. But the other two kind of had a choice, like they chose to go out and do something and it just ended bad. But that one, I felt like it was just bad time. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button, man. Make sure you're entered inside that giveaway so you can win a Cyberpunk 2077 or the money equivalent. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Happy holidays. Ah!